Hi, my name is John. And my name is Lloyd. And we're the hosts of The Pint. A pop culture podcast. Lloyd, if you had to tell any of the people out there that might be listening to The Pint for the first time about anything uh, unsavory or disconcerting we might do on the show, what would you warn them about? Well, sometimes we drop spoilers and sometimes we swear like motherfucking sailors. Fuck yeah, we do. When leaving the theater... We suggest that the exit at the front of the auditorium will allow you easier access to the parking areas. Thank you. They have murder boners for this kid. <laughs> it's already <laughs> over budget, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I put the uh, Instagram of me watching the DVD the other night, and he's like, burn it when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> this it, is a really bad oh. IMDb summary. <laughs> Okay. Yes, Dante's it is. Peak is no, worse shut than up. Volcano. Shut up. Dante's shut Peak up. is worse. You don't need to start it's fights worse. here, John. Shut up. It's dumb. No. <laughs> okay. I get excited. We're back, motherfuckers. This is our podcast now. I'm Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler. And you're listening to the Forgotten Cinema's takeover of Pina Comics. This episode, we're highlighting a film that, for a variety of reasons, was forgotten by audiences. Whether it be because a more popular movie was released at the same time, or the movie simply didn't catch on with an audience in its initial run. We'll be joined by Planet Comics' own John Amenta, and all of us will discuss what we love about the movie, or perhaps don't love about it, but we'll always recommend you revisit it. If you enjoy this episode, you can find more Forgotten Cinema on all podcast platforms. What's up, Butler? Nothing. What's up with you? Nothing. Uh, I should say that we're not only joined by John Amenta, but we also join uh, by... Uh, go ahead. Who are we joined by, brother? I don't want to keep talking. You go. <laughs> I just throwing it over to me. This wasn't part of the plan. I, this is. I told you. It's all new now. Joe Doherty is joining us on this episode. Uh, Joe's a fan. Hey, say hi, Joe. Hey, hey, guys. Joe and I actually exchange emails a lot of times about movies and, and what he's watching and what I watch and throw suggestions back and forth. Uh, Joe suggested a film. I think I talked about it on the podcast. I don't know if it came out yet or if it's out yet, but Suture. We talked about that where I had never even heard of it, Joe. When you sent it to me, so and uh, and I watched it. Uh, I always talk about my buddy Adrian on the podcast. I actually sent it to him and said, "Like, have you seen this?" And we kind of had a back and forth. So I appreciate. I always appreciate the recommendations. Well, me too. I appreciate them, and uh, thank you for turning me on to the Criterion Channel. Unfortunately, <laughs> now I, I had to cancel it for a while. <laughs> oh well, you can come back at some point. It's fine. I, I'm. Sh- I would say that I'm sharing the cr- Criterion Channel, so I understand that. I, I definitely understand you want to cut costs. John, how are you? Good, good, good. Good to have you guys back. Uh, it's been a lonely, at this point, at recording time, three months since we uh, we ended Forgotten Takeover February. But, you know, mm-hmm. I had the idea. I said, hey, you know what? That was fun. Uh, let's do four more and, uh, and, and sprinkle them out through the course of the year. And you guys are greedy fucks, so you were very happy to come back in <laughs> and, uh, and, and just and take over, so. Absolutely. And Butler, what are we doing today? What, what's our first movie we're doing today? Oh, we had no choice. We were given a selection. And uh, as soon as we looked at the list, we knew the first episode had to be X-Files. I want to believe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely. What's it about, Mike? Do I need to introduce the X-Files? It's about the X-Files. Well, you don't now, need to introduce it to me. I know it. <laughs> uh, Mulder and Scully come together after the TV show ended to solve a case involving a missing FBI agent. Anything else gets into spoiler territory, so I don't want to say the rest. Of, it's oh, basically for out loud. It's a basically they follow a, a psychic, Billy Connolly, uh, Col- Col- Colony, Con- Connolly, 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 Connolly. Billy Connolly's <laughs> uh, psychic. He's a disgraced priest, and they follow him to try to discover the whereabouts of this girl. And it turns out there's a scientist out there putting body parts together, Frankenstein style. All right, but but clearly you didn't prepare for this episode. Right, I did not get the synopsis. I want to believe. <laughs> As a runtime of 104 minutes, it's rated PG-13, production budget of $30 million. It came out on Friday, July 25th, 2008, which kind of surprised me. I, I mean, it shouldn't because I saw it in theaters. I think we saw it together. But we did I didn't. I, we didn't see I thought we did. No. Oh, okay. But I, I'm surprised that this is a summer film. I think that's a huge mistake, and we can get to that later. Yep. Uh, but it's not a summer film. But anyways, opening weekend, it did $10 million. Domestic was twenty point nine million, and worldwide was sixty nine point three million dollars. So I, it wasn't a hit. And I actually have numbers um, as of I want to say as of when I checked it, uh, its DVD sales were at seventeen point four million dollars in the U.S. So you can just add that to the end of the worldwide there. Like it, it didn't do well enough to get a third one, obviously. Production company was Crying Box Productions, Dune Entertainment Three, and Ten Thirteen Productions, and distributed by Twentieth Century Fox. 
I said it came out on the 25th of July. It went up against, in a wide release, Step Brothers. I know we're probably all fans of Step Brothers. I'm not a big fan of Step Brothers, but I know it was a huge hit. And the limited release, the documentary Man on Wire. And then a wide release uh, the week after, which was August 1st, you had The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, which is <laughs> not good. <laughs> 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 you also had the Kevin Costner run. I, he, oh no, Kevin Costner. He was voting. It's called Swing Vote. I don't know if you guys remember Swing Vote. I, I actually did see that in the theater. Uh, you also had a limited release of the Midnight Meat Train and Frozen River. What's up, Joe? Did you see Swing Vote? No, but I vaguely remember it now, and yeah, he I probably was, like, avoided it on just, purpose. Yeah, it, like he didn't vote or something like that, and like he, it was deadlocked, and everyone was trying to curry his favor to get his vote. It was, it's definitely farcical. <laughs> Uh, you had the week before, the 18th of July, and a wide release. Then this is probably why this movie didn't. In, this is probably why the X Files partly didn't do well. Is Butler? Do you know what came out July 18th, 2008? I do because I remember why I had to see this at a different theater. Uh, it was The Dark Knight. Right. So The Dark Knight came out that week, which completely destroyed everything. You also had Mamma Mia and Space Chimps. <laughs> and a limited release Trans Siberian. <laughs> I remember Dark Knight. People would always clap at the end of that film, walking out of the theater. So it was, uh, it was quite the event. I think there's, we'll get to it, but there's also quotes from everyone how they, they basically say like it was bad coming out, uh, right after the Dark Knight. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. So this movie was directed by Chris Carter. Uh, he's obviously done a bunch of X Files episodes. He's the creator of the X Files. It's also written by Chris Carter and Frank Spotnitz. Carter has done Millennium, the TV show Millennium. TV show Harsh Realm and The Lone Gunman. These are all Lone Gunman was in the X Files universe, and even actually Millennium is too. Uh, Frank Spotnitz has done Sunset After Dark, the TV show The Man in the High Castle, and the and Ransom, another TV show. Cinematographer was Bill Rowe, who's done Electra. It has him listed on every single episode of Castle, but I wonder if he's just overseeing other people coming in. But he's for Castle and the movie for sale by owner. A composer was Mark Snow. He's done The New Mutants, uh, TV show Blue Bloods. And disturbing behavior, edited by Richard A. Harris, who has won an Oscar for Titanic and was nominated for Terminator 2: Judgment Day. He's also done Fletch, Fletch Lives, and a bunch of other movies. And this is also produced by Chris Carter and Frank Spotnitz, who basically it's the same shows I mentioned before: X Files and Harsh Rum and all that good stuff. This movie stars, surprise, David Duchovny as Fox Mulder. Uh, he has been uh, more recently he's been in the movie The Bubble, which I did not like, but he's good in it. He's also in Return to Me, the TV show Californication, and Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, of course. Everyone remembers that, right? We all remember that. He's in oh, that. Yeah. Yes? Oh, yeah. Excellent. J- Jillian Anderson plays Dana Scully. She is on the TV show The First Lady. That's out now. Uh, she's also in Sex Education, which is a TV show, The Fall, and a TV show that Mike and I like. What is it, Mike? What is oh, she that, in? She's on Hannibal. There you go. We're big Hannibal fans here at the Forgotten Cinema. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Amanda Peet as Dakota Whitney. She's in the whole nine yards. Something's got to give in the TV show Brockmire. Billy Connolly as Father Joe from the Boondock Saints. Timeline, which is an episode that is out now from Forgotten Cinema. And The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies. Nice plug, uh, ex- Mike. Nice plug. <laughs> now, real quick question, though. Is he the same as oh. Billy? Is he the same as Billy Colony? <laughs> 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 you, hey, John, do you remember Connolly? Uh, coming in to replace Howard Hessman in Head of the Class TV show. That's Head how, of the Class, that's yeah. How I was, always remembered me him. Me too, me too. I was going to mention yeah. that. Yeah. Bill, I, Billy Connolly, I always think of he, the last season of Head of the Class, because I think it was one season and done. And also the fact that he is like John Cleese with a wig on. Like, he, <laughs> there's something about him that is so John Cleese, uh, like doing a Scottish accent with a long wig on. I, I would not be surprised if we found out all of a sudden that Billy Connolly this whole time has been John Cleese in a character. <laughs> uh, now I, I I'll never really get that out of my head. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, really. No problem. <laughs> Joe, Joe, you're about the same age as my, me and John, right? Okay. So all three of us know him from ahead of the class. But Mike, where do you know Billy Connolly from? Boondock Saints in this that, movie. I was just, yeah. That, no. I think a lot of younger people know him from that. I know. I, I can't stand that movie. But Stupid movie. A, a lot of younger movie. people. Uh, the the document I think I talked about this before. The documentary about how they made the Boondock Saint is really good. That's something that is like, holy crap, this guy is nuts. Overnight, right? Yes, I that. yes. Yeah. Uh, do you do? You, I remember the scene when like he tried to like run him over, or he was like he, they were out there. Remember that? I was just like, what's yeah. happening? I mean, he basically <laughs> just pissed off Weinstein. It was all over. I think that a lot of younger people know Connolly from Boondock Saint. So thank you, Butler, for proving that right. No problem, old man. <laughs> Exhibit plays Agent Mosley. He's from Gridiron Gang and Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans, and de- the movie Derailed. 
Mitch Pelleggi as or Pelleggi as Walter Skinner from the movie Shocker. He's in the TV show Walker and a movie that we did. Butler, what is that? Uh, Twelve o'clock high? No. Three o'clock high. Three Twelve o'clock, o'clock high. high. I, I I got most of the title. Oh, <laughs> God, you young people. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then that's pretty much it. I mean, there's you got you know, the bad guys you really don't see a lot. Yeah, as, as uh, I guess Shanke or jo- they never really say his name. He's uh, a big he's he, a big Canadian yeah. um yes. character actor. He was if you ever watched the uh, Battlestar Galactica reboot, he was the Cylon that held uh, held uh-huh. Starbuck hostage for like two years. And see, like, I, was... I did watch it. I don't remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's in Memento. Memento. Yeah. yeah, and Blade Trinity. Alex Diakum as Gaunt Man. That's the guy that they take his head off at the end. He's in Ernest Rides again, if you guys are interested in Valentine. And then Adam Godley as Father Yabaro, who I only know him as the uh, teacher in Love Actually. That's the only way I know him is in that in the end of him. That's See the guy with the giant the giant ears? That guy? Yeah, the father. Okay, the father yeah. that's always like, let them die. That guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert. I like this film. <laughs> so, um, but I do, I do know there is some stuff. I was actually more focusing in this. This is probably my third watch of this film. I don't know how you, how many times you guys have seen this, or if you're big X Files fans, or you know, um, we can get into that. But the big thing that I was kind of focusing on in this watch was the theme, was a lot of the themes of, of Scully uh, and just kind of like faith versus science and all that stuff. Um, I guess I mean let's kick it up, Joe. Since you're new, let's kick it off with you if you want to. Um, Give us maybe because we hear John enough. So if you want to give us some something that maybe the first thing that came actually, you know, is this the first time you watched it or second time or third? First time. First time. time? Oh wow, awesome! Then I'm. I you know what? Then right off the top, I'd love to hear what you thought. Okay, so I don't have a lot of X Files experience. I watched probably two episodes of the show just because I was in college, didn't have time. I did see the first movie uh, in the theaters with my friend who just had to spend the whole time after it, just explaining everything watching this one. I feel like, uh, it was a step down from everything else. Cause the last X filed movie was all about aliens. And this is just mm-hmm. about, this could have been any kind of sort of murder mystery type of show, not really mm-hmm. X files ish, but that's my impression off the four hours of X files. I've probably seen before this. <laughs> <laughs> Butler, care to respond? <laughs> How dare you? You've never seen the X-Files? Uh, I'm holding back my anger. Uh, but I do agree that it is kind of like an episode of a murder mystery show. I think you and I have talked about that a bunch of times. This is my third time watching it, but I watched it two times basically right when it came out. And I've only seen bits and pieces. This is the first time watching it all the way through, probably since it first came out. Um, oh, wow. And I think time has made me appreciate it more because I, like you put on your Instagram story when you were watching this film, I miss them. Mm-hmm. I, I like that it's an episode of the X-Files. It's a little long. However, it does run a little long, I think, as well. Well, and, and to Joe's point, it's tough because uh, uh, the focus in this is a lot about the char- it's character development. And Joe isn't coming into this. Right. Like, and a lot of the people that haven't watched a lot of the X-Files not coming in with all those years of just Caring. knowledge of, of – Yeah. Right. Like it was a big deal. Not to, I, We'll get to you, John. Sorry. But it was a big deal when – they kiss in, when they're in bed together in the movie. Oh, the audience kiss, cheered when I saw it in yeah, theaters. When they kissed in the movie because they never, even though they had a child within the series, they never showed them romantic like that. There were moments. There's there's actual moments where he goes to kiss her in the show and she gets stung by a bee that paralyzes her and then she's whisked away. It was like a huge ending oh, to the season. That was, was the like, movie. That was Fight right, the Future. Right. But it was like, that was, I'm sorry, but you're right. But that was like a there's never had that stuff so just to see it in this film was a big deal for a lot of people who watch the x-files so i can totally understand how that really doesn't connect with you because you don't know that and it's not the movie's responsibility to make sure it, it, that you should know that you, you you they need to present it to you in a way where you ne- you should never know the series john what do you think about it so uh i am in the middle of you guys i have seen a ton of the x-files i enjoy it but i'm not a huge fan um mm-hmm. I always was one of those people that I enjoy the monster of the week episodes much more than the mythology, like the black oil and, and, you know, the, uh, the alien uh, assassins with no eyes, all that stuff. That, that's fine, but I kind of tended to like the, the ones that kind of go off in their own direction, which this one is. So here, here's, they could have gone three ways with this movie. They could have gone mythology, which the first movie was, and they didn't want to do that. I get it. They could have gone monster of the week which is essentially kind of what they did, or they could have gone with the third type of X-Files episode, which would be the, like, strange narrative, like, 
like the one where they were in the Bermuda Triangle or the one where they ended up uh, in the black and white like monster movie, like like how they would do those episodes that were a little more comedic. And I think it was a smart idea to go with the monster of the week and seeing this for the second time. I saw this way back when, when it came out like on video, I liked it more this time because it's a character piece, like you guys had said, and it really is heavily uh, weighed on, you know, them getting back together and, you know, kind of meeting up with these people after six or seven years of not seeing them. But as weird as the central, I guess, plot or what's happening in the background is, it's not good enough to hold a movie of this length. Like when this movie originally came out, I remember like, you know, this is the internet was a thing then that they actually went, they they went as far as to like have pictures of werewolves. I was going to bring that up. Yep. To make you think this was going to be a Scully and Mulder versus werewolves movie. And I remember thinking that's fucking brilliant. Cause as far as I remember, I could be wrong. I don't remember them doing that in the show. Um, but like that, it's just a cool idea. The idea of what they did is much more expansive. Holy cow. You know, pedophile priest, uh, these two gay men, uh, one of them is dying of cancer and they're trying to Frankenstein. I mean, it, it's actually a cool concept, but like Joe and, and you said, it feels like you could have replaced Mulder and Scully in that story with any two cop characters and it could have been its own thing. I just don't feel like they, they went hard enough. Especially if they if if they thought this was going to get them another movie, it got them two more series like ten years later. Um, uh, I think streaming got them that, but yes, uh, yeah, I think they just Fox is looking for content. Everyone's right. looking for content. Yeah, uh, I I think I think a combination of it not being a strong enough story, plus opening the week after the Dark Knight. Like, <laughs> man, even if you had a strong story, the Dark Knight could have fucked that all up. So. Well, I don't hindsight's know. twenty twenty. I don't know if anybody really thought that the Dark Knight, because the Dark Knight is obviously close to perfect. It's a really good film, but like, did anybody expect it to be that way? Did anybody expect it to be this monster? I don't know. I mean, I don't remember if that was the you know everyone's based, excited to see based it. on staffing at the time at the theater. No, no, we did not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's you bring up a good point, John. I wonder if this movie didn't have if it wasn't an X Files film and it was just two other people. Um. Would it have, would we have, we'd be viewing this movie better or worse? What do you guys think? I don't know if it'd be better or worse. I don't think it, the story does it a disservice for being an X Files film. I just feel like it's not big enough. Like it, it's kind of, it, if the movie I'm going to use is worse, but it's like Star Trek Insurrection. Like that's not, a, there's no reason that should have <laughs> been a movie, right? That should have been an episode. That should have been a half an episode. <laughs> like they, that was so. Again, you're, you're coming out seven years after the show ends, 10 years after the first movie. You've got to do something bigger. And I just felt like they didn't do anything big enough. I felt like this storyline might have made a really good six-part Fox series. You know what I mean? If, if they had and it lengthened it out a bit. I just feel like for a movie, it just doesn't totally work. Uh, well, I mean, Joe, you're coming at it as not knowing anything about the X-Files anyway. So um, are you... Would it, would it have even mattered if they swapped out the characters and didn't have them in there? Would it even would it, it just been the same thing, right? You would have felt the same way. Yeah. Well, first off, I have to tell you, I heard enough about the X Files to know that they had never gotten together on screen. Okay. okay. So I was even shocked about the bed scene. I just was thinking more of the aliens and all these. All the thing I heard of was aliens, 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 and then I get a standalone story. Now mm-hmm. I think that back, you know, back in two thousand eight when we hadn't been inundated with content, and back then I actually had time to watch all the time, and I watched everything. That's the movie. If you plugged other people in, I would probably be looking at the Netflix discs or something. And I'm like, okay, I'll watch that. Right. And I probably would watch it. I mean, that's the kind of B ish thriller I would see. You know, I think X Files to me, it would have to, I, I assume it would be bigger. I'm not, I don't think I remember, I don't remember this was out. So it, Dark Knight took over my brain, but it never really registered back then. Well, brother, what do you think? Uh, I agree with a lot of John's points, but I don't think you could do it with a, another cast of characters. This couldn't be a Law & Order episode. It'd be too weird. It would upset the audience of 50-plus, uh, you know, septuagenarians or whatever. Well, let's just I pretend just, it was never an X-Files film. It's just I a just, regular film. <laughs> I just don't know if it would work as a regular film because there are so many concepts that aren't presented there. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, you know, you would cut it down because I think 40 minutes or so are dealing with, you know, Mulder and Scully's 
personal stories and their journey. But I also think that would lessen it because a big chunk of this story is Scully's story. You know, as much as it is Mulder, you know, realizing he is Agent Mulder, uh, it's far more Scully's coming to grips with her scientific side and her religious side. I think this movie does it better than most episodes, and there are plenty of episodes that deal with it. But I think it's a small screen adventure. It's like John said, a, a two part, three part, you know, episode within that revival series. And I think looking at it from that way, looking at it again on the small screen than what I did on the big screen, I'm much more appreciative of this film. But Fight the Future is awesome. It's a great film for both X Files. I don't know if Joe, if you liked the movie Fight the Future, you just talked about your friend discussing it at the end, but that might have given you a bad taste in your mouth. But it was cool. It's got action. It's a little bit more exciting. It's got locales. This is snow. You know, the same old Mark Snow TV score, which I like Mark Snow. and I love the score of the show in the movie, but it just isn't big enough. And I think the werewolf concept, something like that, could have done what they wanted to do, where this was supposed to launch one-off movies. Mm-hmm. And I just don't think it was big enough. But on the small screen where it's small, I really enjoyed it. I think that it would have been a different film if they weren't in it. It would be more, there would be more action. They'd cut out the Scully stuff because that stuff really goes, goes plays to her character, plays to the seasons, uh, the, you know, the previous, uh, seasons of Scully that we've, we yep. know about her. Uh, the first movie is sandwiched in between two seasons. So it has that luxury of having, you know, you just finished the X Files first, uh, season four, season five. Five, I uh, think. Movie comes out and the season six is going to start, you know, right up after. So it has that luxury. This movie, unfortunately, uh, was pushed back for like, was delayed five years. So this, the original plan was this movie to come out right after the show ended. And then basically Chris Carter and Fox got into a legal battle. Uh, he sued them and that, and it, it was always going to, it was going to be, about the mythology the original intent was after the show ended it was going to be about aliens and all that stuff but because it got pushed for five years carter opted to do the standalone to make make it more appealing for people unfamiliar so i mean i hate to say that the delay hurt uh because you know you are five years removed from the from the show um that does kind of people forget people move on there's other stuff coming out lost is probably out at this point and Mm -hmm. you know people are all into that so uh, that probably did not help. Do you think it would, do you think we would have got a different film? Obviously, uh, right, right after the show ended anyone. I think so. I think yeah. you'd have gotten a bigger budget. I think you'd have gotten more attention. You'd have gotten more eyeballs mm-hmm. on it. Fox would give him more money. Mm-hmm. I think five years later, it's just, all right, let's see what this will do. Maybe it'll do something. Maybe it won't. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they would have put a lot more into their IP had it been fresh on people's mind right after the show ended. You know, like you said, five years later, people interest started to wane onto Lost and stuff like that. I mean, the hardcore fans came and see, saw it. I think that's why it made, you know, it was a not a success, but it wasn't a huge bomb. And I think that was mm-hmm. the fans. But you need you need more than the fans. You need casual people to go. Oh, that looks kind of cool. Which mm-hmm. werewolves are kind of cool. <laughs> you're, you're keep pushing the werewolves. Uh. Listen, I remember when, like what the John said on the internet. I remember seeing those leaked pictures of the werewolves and going. Oh fuck yeah, werewolves! Let's go. They were like they were like dog soldier werewolves. They were yeah, being exactly. like bipedal, and I remember seeing that and going, uh, "Man, this looks fucking awesome!" And and then you know I didn't see it in the theaters, and when when I finally saw it, I was just like, you know, I, again I'll say it. See, watching it this time was an improvement over the last time because expectations. You know, yeah. you, you, you're making a big movie. You're making this movie that's that's got a huge fandom. And like you just said, you've got to try to include like the casual moviegoer as well. And first things first is, okay, so it's fine for you to have your your hero's journey, you know, uh, from, from Mulder and Scully and see where they're at now for the casual person. But you've got to have like a bigger hook. And the, the hook is so odd in this movie because even when you get into it, okay, so it's very Frankenstein-y. But there's never, like, there's not a creature. You know what I mean? We, mm-hmm. There's a double-headed dog that you barely see. And <laughs> there's a bunch of scenes of this really weakened guy, like, on a, on a gurney, like, nine times. And every once in a while, you get a hint. You see his hand is a woman's hand. Or you see he's got, you know, obviously his head has come off at some point. That's all very cool and very spooky. But it never really gets past that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, it, it's it's a really cool concept, that I feel like they just didn't like 
put enough on. They didn't, they didn't, you know, I want a little bit more mustard on my hot dog and there's just a little bit on there. So John, so, if they made it like oh, rated R hardcore, yes, would that yeah. have been better if they made it a much more of a horror film out of that? Yeah. Much or, or more, gory, much more creepy. Or if it was a slightly, cause this movie, how long is this movie? Like an hour an and hour, 50 four, hour 44. You know, I did just list the facts, John, about 20 minutes. I'm ago. sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Four minutes. I was so entranced by your voice. I lost it. Um, Thank you. <laughs> no. So if this movie was like 210, 215, where they could have added a little bit more of that body horror, even I, I don't need it to be really gory, but just like focus on that a little bit more because it just seems like it takes a while for us to figure out what's going on. And even when we figure out what's going on, it's just kind of like it, it's hard. It's hard for me to even describe in this movie like like i think the best reaction in the whole movie to anybody is when when skinner goes in the room and sees the head and goes what are you doing here like that's what i wanted to feel like more i wanted to see more of that like craziness and we, we really didn't get a lot of it what did you guys think of the look of the film uh like the act now just a little backstory the, the x-files shot in vancouver for the first five years and then they left and went to la uh, for, and, and there was a significant shift in how the show looked when that happened. Uh, but now they return to Vancouver for this film. And I'm curious, and we'll start with Joe since John's been talking all the time. Uh, what, <laughs> what, um, what did you think of the look of the film? Well, first off, I have this written down. Uh, I lived in West Virginia for a couple of years. There is not that much wide open space in the whole state <laughs> as in that one field. Like you get the two major school football field. That's all you got. So I'm like, why not just say it was in the Rockies somewhere? I don't see why they pick West Virginia. <laughs> Probably because the, they could conceivably say that, uh, you know, you could drive from D.C. to there and stuff like that. That's like, you true. know, that's, that's probably true. what they do that most. Skinner could get there faster. Okay, yeah, so yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, so also my vision of watching the X-Files is the green. Uh, the dark and darkness in the green. I don't feel like this was the same film that way. It was, I mean, it still had plenty of darkness and scenes, but not that sort of sci-fi tint to it is what I would mm -hmm. call that, that green sort of glow. And so that's why this to me looks like a standalone movie. They do have that yeah. green in when they do the, uh, they go to the dorms for the uh, sex offenders. Yes. And I, one of the notes I have is that they purposely went around and put green lights in the in the in the uh, in the lights throughout the area to give it that greenish creepy glow. So that green you're talking about is there, but I hear what you're saying. But it it might be difficult too with all the snow, with just you know the darkness and there is a lot of like stark white and black and all that stuff. So I I definitely hear what you're saying there. I actually like the look of this movie quite a bit. I I like the fact that they're back in Vancouver because Vancouver adds a little bit of a of a mystery mystery element. Just kind of like it. It's not something I've you know seen before. I don't know, Butler. What do you think? Uh, I like the look of like the pool, the na nature area, or whatever they call it, that I'd never heard of. Um, like buildings like that add to the X Filesness of it. It's all very old, very Americana, kind of like the the Monster of the Week episodes where they go into the middle of rural whatever, mm -hmm. and they're going to solve a case. The pedophile complex definitely is lit better. The pedophile um, complex. Nice. But like the amount of snow, we talk about it on the podcast, and I think we did a few weeks ago as well, that if it's super snowy, it's not meant for the summertime. That yeah, right, right there is like, that affects your viewing as a theater goer. It doesn't mm -hmm. affect my viewing now watching it on TV, but as a theater goer, you don't want something in the summertime super mm -hmm. snowy like that. You don't necessarily want tons of snows and snow plows you're out of that season mm -hmm. you're happy it's gone uh so i think that hurts it too that's it's a november october release right there because of that yeah Just i mean i there's def there's definitely something to, to say about atmosphere of the time of uh of year you're in to see a movie if the movie needs it too like so like we're saying we're all talking about i mean i like this film but i i readily admit that this film is not strong as other films but a movie like die hard which is fantastic you know, is a Christmas film, but doesn't come out on Christmas. You know, it didn't come out on Christmas, came out, I think it was the summer, right? That was a summer film. Yeah. yeah. But like, yeah. So the movie has to be really good to overcome that obstacle. Right. Um, but when a movie isn't that good, yes, I think when it comes out is very important. I agree with you there. John, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like you just said, Die Hard, uh, uh, Batman Returns came out in June. That's a Christmas, you know, mm -hmm. s like, you know, mm -hmm. a snowy movie to an extent. It can work. But this movie is very – this movie, not just in, like, the uh, idea of, <clears throat> like, the snow and everything. It's very dark 
kind of dour movie. And, and I think that plays into it as much as like what Butler's saying, not just the, um, like, the, the snowiness of it and everything, but like the just actual, the whole, it's a fucking, it's about pedophiles. It's about, you know, it's, it's a bummer of a movie. There's a lot of stuff going on here. You know, there's a little kid dying of like some horrible brain disease and father Joe is, you know, molested 37 kids and Scully is, is having this crisis of faith and Mulder has been on the run. It, it's not a feel good movie at all. And you often think of the summertime as, as Butler said, you know, Jurassic Park and these movies, you go in and have a great, wonderful time and, and leave and, and feel better about yourself. This is, this is definitely a dour film. So I think that that can make it hard, especially the people that just come in off the street. Hey, let's go X Files. Let's go check that out. Jesus Christ, man. There, there's a pedophile, like, Tears of blood and like, oh my CGI lord! CGI tears, CGI yeah. tears. They don't really. uh, Well, let's let's talk. How about let's let's get into Father Joe a little bit, um, because the whole idea and this actually probably goes to, and we don't have to get into deep theological discussion about it. The idea that for Scully, she has to you know rectify the uh, reconcile the fact, excuse me, that Father Joe is somebody who has done you know these awful awful things and obviously from uh, extremely just just horrible but he has found he believes that god will forgive him that that these visions are because of that um that that god is speaking to him and that he is he is hoping for absolution and forgiveness and she cannot deal with that just do you do you like that do you do you guys enjoy that that the scully's i guess uh, emotional arc in the film do, I mean, I know we mentioned it a couple of times, but it, was it something that was interesting enough for you to stay with it, or did you just find it distracting? I think I would prefer it at a different spot. I think it was distracting in this movie. Mm -hmm. I liked it, but I kept thinking, well, well yeah, where's the storyline going? Why aren't we solving this? You know, where where this agent is? Where you know who's doing all these crazy Frankenstein things? And yeah, I thought that was sort of it was really distracting. It sort of drove the stopped the put the movie to a halt. And when she goes into the into his little complex room and they're talking, and it was a very important scene. It just to me it didn't fit with the movie. And I guess I also kind of had a problem that he why well, they need to make him a pedophile. I think in a regular like thriller of somebody else, I think that's good. I just think it was very distracting too in this. And yeah, I just you know I couldn't figure out some why these things fit into the X Files universe. Although, like I said, I'm not the the expert in that but yeah i just could <laughs> no no worries it was, it was just distracting to have her be doing that and i thought having uh father joe be a pedophile was too distracting also i think the pedophile aspect of it for me made sense especially at the end like when Mulder points out that you know he okay. died he died of the same thing you know as as his victim he died i bet you if you get that paperwork he died at the same time mm -hmm. so i think that's supposed to um you know uh, obviously, you know, point out to that the part I have a problem with in this. And again, I'm not the biggest X Files fan, so maybe you guys know more than me. Is that Mulder is is like incredibly defensive of Father Joe multiple times, and it bothers me because, like, you know, at one point he says, you know, they they're they're doing everything they can to discredit this man's name, and it's like he molested 37 fucking kids. Like, I, I there was a few moments. In this movie where Mulder, a couple, there's a couple things I want to point out. A couple times when Mulder seems a little bit too defensive of Father Joe. And I understand that Father Joe is his key to proving that this is an X-Files case. So I kind of understand that as well because he's obsessive. The other part is just more funny is that the, um, the Callum Keith Rennie character just keeps showing up when it's convenient for someone to run into him. He literally, when, when the, when the FBI is in that building, he just, he gets off the elevator and walks behind them all. When, when Mulder goes to the feed store at the end, he just happens to show up to get the same drug Mulder's talking about. There was a couple of coincidental, um, plot devices there with him that I thought were a little weird, but I don't know. There's, there's a lot of coincidence in this film, not just with him, with him, but the, the fact that. Uh, Scully's stem cell research suddenly leads to the one image of the double headed dogs in Russia. And she suddenly, you know, like, yeah, I, it, it's, it's a little quick. I, I hear you. Um, Butler, do you want to defend Mulder? <laughs> I would love to defend Mulder. So uh, Mulder, first of all, Mulder doesn't believe psychics. Uh, the, they, they mentioned Lee Boggs earlier, but I think this episode has a lot to do with the Lee Boggs episode beyond the sea, which I believe is season one of the X-Files. 
whereas another crisis of faith with Scully of believing a psychic, Mulder's usually quick to discount them, and in this case, he's not. And I think the fact that he is a confected sex offender is why he's so quick is, is quicker to believe the priest than most other psychics because he's got nothing to gain from it. Lee Boggs was trying to get off of death row. Con- Con- Connolly's character. <laughs> <laughs> you really can't say this I can't. Name. I can't. Uh, his character is not asking for anything. He's not getting off death row. He's always going to be a pedophile. He's not getting off a sex offender list. And I think that's why Mulder is more quick to believe him. He's got nothing to gain from this. That's why Mulder has to believe him. And that's why Mulder wants to believe him. Well, he's Mulder's always quick to believe. Uh, not psychics, though, but yeah. Well, but he, he does say that when he first gets there, he just starts throwing out, you know, Oh yeah, like he's he quick just, to discount him. Yeah, right. But he did. But the other thing too um, is that he proves he to Mulder's satisfaction. He proves that he's right. Like the whole thing about the dirty glass, and then they find the girl. Yep. How he led him to the the, the hand, like all that stuff. So I think, but I do, Mulder is always somebody who's like that. But also like that 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 goes to the title of the movie. I want to believe. Like Mulder always wants to believe. Sully Scully has a harder time to do that. Now, all that being said it's not this movie's job to, to make up for the, you know what I mean? That this movie's job is to explain this in a way where you don't need the show. So you're right, John, that that's, you know, your, your impressions of Mulder are valid because you don't know Mulder. So you don't know, you know, that all these, all these character choices that he's making are coming from a place that you have no idea where they're coming from. So, and that's, that's the movie's fault. The movie needs to explain that better to you because of that. So I, I, I actually agree with you, John there. I mean, I, the movie should have done a better job now. I love the X Files, so I'm okay with it. But I, I agree with you. It's it's, it's a weird dichotomy. I live here. <laughs> That's the problem I think with this movie compared to Fight the Future is so much of it relies on, like you and I feel being fans of the film mm-hmm. or the the TV series and knowing a bunch of stuff and being able to harken back to these older episodes and how they believe in the Scully's crisis of faith. Whereas Fight the Future, within the first you know thirty minutes of the movie. You know what happened to Mulder. You know what he is. You know who he is. They explain that a lot better in the intro of these characters. And they don't really introduce these characters in this film. You don't get a Mulder Scully introduction. You just kind of get thrust into their world. But I do like their reveals. One of my notes is that I don't know how you guys thought about this. The reveals of Mulder and Scully and even Skinner, I actually like the way they reveal all three of them. I don't know if you anybody picked up on that, if you thought there were – because a lot of times we talk about in the other in, in the Forgotten Cinema show when we talk about movies that sometimes character reveals are just not great. They just kind of show up. They kind of start walking onto the frame. I think the one that pops in my head, Butler, is 30 Days a Night because the main bad guy in that just kind of like turns the corner around the street. And I think, oh, okay, he's the bad guy. Yeah, no pop so circumstance. Yeah. I, I'm curious if you guys – did you – did anybody recognize the reveals? Did, did did they stand out to you as they stood out to me? So, uh, you know, I was actually going to ask about that. It seemed to me that so having us in the show that Skinner just showed up as a convenience to mm-hmm. get him into the to the to the movie. Agreed. You know, like, right? It's like, oh, here's the assistant director is going to drive up, and then all of a sudden he's doing everything because he believes Scully and he likes Mulder and wants to help. Mm-hmm. But I thought he just sort of showed up, and to me, I was like, oh, this is fan service. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, that wasn't a good reveal. But um, if you're saying that maybe it came out okay, I don't know. But to me, I, I just, just oh, I met in the boxes. frame. I met oh. like like just the back of his head. He pops in. Skinner's um, great in the frame, but Scully pointing and going, "That's my boss. That's Walter Skinner." Was really weird. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> That's no, him. You're right, Joe. It, it was fan. It's completely fan service. They didn't have. They didn't know how yeah. to put him in there yeah john what do you think of any any of the real stand out to you or are you just kind of like what are you guys talking about your idiot no i mean i liked the uh the intros um i will say and you know this is just something they do in movies that take place time after you saw the characters last is duchovny's beard sucked i i, I don't okay. know just just for for the love of christ have him grow a beard film around it and either keep it or shave it off. Stop with the fake fucking beards. I get it. I get that there's a that beard. Uh, but then if he can't, then don't have him grow a beard. <laughs> like maybe, maybe, maybe give him a gray streak in his hair. We get it. He's a little bit older. His beard was distracting to me. And I know it was distracting to everybody because they made him shave it off. I understand that's a character choice. Like I'm back in the game, baby. But I, mm-hmm. I hate fake fucking beards in, uh, in movies and TV shows. I, I was a huge fan of Lost and Lost was incredibly, egregious at that like these bad fake beards to show time has changed and uh and everything did, oh 
Did did you ever see how they put the fake beards on the people in Lost? Yes, they yes. They had them uh, shave off their own beard hair and they glued it back on on those scenes. But uh, but like you said, uh, um, the Skinner the Skinner thing it was again as a, as a casual fan of the, of the um, X Files, it was cool to see him. But it was total fan service and plot, uh, you know, uh, contrivance, I guess, because they just needed him to be there. Much like you said earlier, why did this movie take place in West Virginia? Because otherwise, he wouldn't be able to get there quickly. Yeah. And the other thing is, I. I, I guess um, one of the other plot points I found kind of odd was you get Scully and I get it. She's, she's Catholic and you know, this has been a point in the show and everything, but she's this really obviously good and advanced doctor. Mm-hmm. Why would she purposely go work for that? Like a, a Catholic hospital where you're going to run into old school thought process and you're going to run into people saying, you know, let the boy die. Like I kind of felt that was weird. Like what, what brought her to that choice where she could have gone and gone to any major hospital, you know, in the United States, probably it's her religion, which is another thing you guys don't like. If you're not a huge fan of the show, you don't know that like her religion is so important to her. She'd have no choice, but to be in a Catholic hospital. Scully is always like on the fence between basically being a doctor or a nun, essentially in her beliefs. (laughs) <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I don't know about none. Yeah. Not none, but yeah, her, she's got strong religious beliefs. Yes. Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think there's really, to me, I don't think the Catholic hospitals quite function that way anymore. Money's too big to really have the priests well, no. make the decisions. And so they I probably don't, but weird. this one does. Like, yeah. yeah. But to me, that was like a dated thing that didn't necessarily mm-hmm. fit in the movie. But also, me, I'm just like looking for inconsistencies and. You know, since you know, I don't have it like the lore to look at. I'm looking at other items like that. You're, you're trying to tear it down. I hear you, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything? Is there anything where my note is? Is there anything worse than a bureaucratic priest? Like that is just <laughs> yeah. like you know. Ah, uh, yes, let them die. It's cheaper that way. I mean, that that happens in real life. Like no, I hear executives, you. they just don't expect the priest to do it. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> um, what? Uh, uh, let's talk about. And we can get into this, like so because I've got little notes here and there that don't make that have no like there there's no theme sense to them. But I'll just pepper them out later. But I want to do I do want to talk about what you guys think of the actual uh, the bad guys, what they're doing, the process, uh, the head transplants. Like, did, were you in on that? Did you like that? Did was that fascinating? Did it scare you? What what, what do you guys think about that? I always thought it was fascinating. I remember afterwards seeing the Scully looking up the dogs and stuff. I actually looked that up, and it's all real. Yes, uh, a lot of that's real, uh, and it's they, terrible. They, they've footage. done it on I monkeys. Never watch that yes. again. Yeah, they've done head transplants um, on monkeys. Yes, and there's the dog with the electrical implant in it, and he's still mm-hmm. eating treats even though he's decapitated. There's some terrible mm-hmm. things, um, but it's to prove that you know you don't need a body that you can keep the head alive and stuff like that. I thought it was it's disgusting but very fascinating. I thought that case is interesting, but I think you don't know enough about the husband, the the guy who's becoming Frankenstein. You don't know enough about who he is where this money's coming from, how he can fund this and get away from it. And I would have liked to have known more. And, you know, this movie's only an hour 44. Maybe knowing a little bit more about the bad guy and being more intimidated about what could happen if he lives longer. Like, what, 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 what is this guy? Just I would have liked to have known more about who's getting stitched together. And you know very little about your villains. What do you guys think, John? Uh, I agree. Fascinating. Like I said earlier, I kind of wish we had more of it. Um, I simultaneously think some of it is very cool and some of it was stupid. So like the, one of the bits I thought was very cool was, you know, the fact that in 2008, you're making a movie where you're coming out straight out and saying that these are two married men, you know, which think 15 years ago, that still, you know, wasn't necessarily like the first thing people are going to jump out at, but there's like the little scenes where like, like, um, the Cal and Keith Rennie character is like laying next to him and telling him it's going to work and you're going to be okay. You actually like feel, you understand, like, you know, this is just, this is a guy who doesn't want to let his, his husband go and he's willing to try anything. Now, something in the stupid end that I don't understand is that this guy, the sick man, the gaunt man, the gaunt man (laughs) is obviously weak. He's obviously, um, you know, he's had, you know, his head transplanted, his arms, legs. Why is he with him in the beginning when they attack yeah. the FBI agent? I don't That's know. I understand that it's just so that you get the arm with the claw marks in it. But like, would you bring your incredibly sick loved one like to go fucking kidnap and murder somebody? I, I thought, yeah, 
Go ahead. I thought go that, ahead. I, that scene just bothered me, especially when, like, so, okay, I hadn't seen this movie in a while. So when you watch it in the beginning, you you kind of forget. You're like, oh, there's two guys that are going to attack, and she gets the upper hand on this one guy. But then as the movie goes along, and you realize this guy is in dire need. He's dying. Why the fuck was he there? I, I just thought that was really dumb. You've got, like, this team of, like, four or five uh, medical, um, you know, the, the Dr. Frankensteins, as you were, you would think there'd be one of those guys that could go with him to do the dirty work, but they send they send the patient, you know, all right, we got to go kidnap um, your next body part. Get up. Come on, get up. Let's go. I just thought that was, I get it. It was so you found the arm in the ice, but it, they could have done it in any other way. The other thing was, why did the arm come off? Why did they remove his arm and bury it? I don't, I didn't understand that. I mean, maybe someone can explain that to me. Like, because they just... Because she hit it with the, I think what happened was was he took she took off the arm with the trowel. No, 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 no. The, I think I, removed surgically removed. I think that I think the trowel hit it and it, it basically was gonna die or it was in trouble. So they removed it because it was gonna be infected or whatever his issues are. It wasn't gonna take. And now why wasn't it in the same dumping ground with the rest of the yeah. stuff? Uh, again, yeah. uh, you know that, this is just it's not good yeah. writing. I don't know. Ooh. I also think it's weird that they picked female bodies for both of the like like well, all the body parts that we know of are female. Oh, and he's this big he, old guy head. Well, he might have been trying. He might have opted for that. He might want to transition like that. I, yeah. Okay. There. But like Which, maybe. Uh, but they like don't that. explain it. You're right. Yeah. They don't explain it. You're right. No, absolutely. If they explain that, then you know maybe we don't have to jump to that conclusion. But that's that's what we're doing here. We but we shouldn't jump to those conclusions. We should know. We sh- they should explain that out. The thing is, even I, the sh- I, even the episodes of the show did a little bit more. Put a little more focus on the villains than I think this film does. It's another point like that. I don't think they explained how lucky it is if he, this guy needs the most rare blood type. You had two women that swim in the pool, have metal or braces, saying they're like their blood types. I mean, <laughs> that is pretty lucky. <laughs> in, in West Virginia, in the boonies, like, a lot of those kind of things showed up, I think, that didn't really didn't make sense, weren't explained, and how, how is that quote, possible? Just very convenient. And in terms and it, of yeah. like, why, why he was fighting. Uh, you know, why they sent the sick guy to get hit with a trowel. Why did he attack first, for that matter, if he was not, not the muscle, right? I mean, he mm-hmm. just reaches his arm around. She hacks it. Because I actually liked that scene. I, mean, I liked it with the, you know, you see the breath behind that. I'm like, that's the kind of good kind of thing I like. And I was just like, well, all of a sudden you have this, and it turns out he's sick, and why was he attacking first? And uh, Yeah, I, 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 didn't, I didn't understand any of that. <laughs> I, I agree. I mean, but I still love it. <laughs> <laughs> I do like I did like the opening in terms of the back and forth uh, where they were showing the kidnapping and showing that they're missing the agent. I like that. Um, I do question why the with the medical alert bracelets, um, the fact that he is uh, someone who, you know, uh, transports organs. Is that only so that he would know what a medical alert bracelet would be? There's no like he never stole an organ. He never right. he never looked for a database well, for people. Like why did they use that aspect? The husband runs the company that transports the organs. Right, right. But so that's, that's it. Though. That's but just why. Yeah. If they he runs the organization, he he transport organs. Why aren't they using their database to find people? Why is he just stumbling upon people? That's a little bit more of a easy find. If all of a sudden it's sure. like, hey, everybody in this organization has been kidnapped. Yeah. Can, can I ask a question? If anybody caught what no. I thought, <laughs> please, pretty please, <laughs> yes, all right, sugar all right. on top. Thank you. Uh, so what I thought might have been a error in a line of dialogue, or maybe I missed something. So they find the um, the head in the cooler, and um, and At Mulder. The end? Well, when they find the head in the cooler, right? Uh, right, they, right, right. And they know oh, they right, know yeah, yes. they know that the Bannon or whatever name is is dead. The FBI mm-hmm. agent. And then they find, you know, and then Dakota Whitney gets thrown down the elevator shaft. Mulder calls Scully and says, you know, Dakota Whitney's dead and, you know, Bannon is dead. We found we found the head or, you know, whatever he tells her. Right. When she figures out the whole thing about the dogs and she tries to call Mulder and she leaves the message, she says the FBI agent is still alive. Did, did you guys catch that? I think she's saying that that the guy's body, the guy's head is on her body. Yeah. Oh. I think, which is what I think the uh, priest's yeah. prediction was that she's still alive because parts of her are alive. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. Okay. Cause that's her body that his head is on. Yeah. No, no, I, I got that. Okay. Okay. It, that makes more sense. It still is a little awkward, but okay. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> no, it, it, you're right. It, you're right. That it's, it's not, 
there's a lot of stuff here that we have to infer and that we're figuring out and we shouldn't have to. Uh, you know, and that's something that we talk about all the time on the show with with these with some of these movies. Even though, you know, we do we don't want movies to be spoon fed to us in terms of you know what's happening, but we do need something. We can't just kind of just try to figure it out on our own. I mean, that's because then we're going to go down tangents that you don't want us to go down. I'm talking to the writers; <laughs> <laughs> they're listening. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I hope. <laughs> Let's get into some uh, critic reviews and get in t- and see if we agree with these and, and you guys tell me what you think uh manhola dargis of the new york times found the film baggy draggy oddly timed and strangely off the mark and that mr carter knows how to grab your attention visually but the amalgam of trashy thriller cliches that he has compiled with frank spotnips another series regular creates its own deadening effect what do we think of that i mean i like <laughs> trashy thriller cliches i have to right. admit like as I said, I if this had different actors, I would pick it up if I had back then when I had all the time, and I would, or if it scrolled by Netflix. I actually like those cliches. I like scenes in the snow. Like it distracted me, irritated me that they made it West Virginia because it's not. But I love the you know these snow you know snow uh, mm-hmm. themes in the movies where everybody's out there and it's scary and it's alone. So I don't mind. The, I actually don't mind the thriller cliches. It just mm-hmm. I don't think it necessarily worked for this movie per se. Frank Lovis of the Film Journal International calls this the plot plays like a PG thirteen seven with body parts, gruesomeness, gloom and doom, but hey, not too much, but don't worry, there's nothing deeply unsettling. So do you think this is like a PG thirteen seven, like not a good we talked you talked about that, Butler, about it getting more gory, maybe? Yeah, I think I don't think that's far off the mark in terms of what they were trying to do. They right. needed to make it R to make people more interested, be like, Hey, it's the X Files, but it's a super hardcore R version of the X Files. If you're going to do standoff movies, which was their original plan, you need to put, like, if you have the mythology episodes be PG-13 adventure movies, cool, and then you have these rated R horror films, I think that mm-hmm. would have been awesome. That would have been dope. I would have been super into that. And they just don't go far enough, um, which I think John is kind of saying, like, he'd like more, that's not necessarily gore, but horror. I think Seven, I was, the first time I saw Seven, I didn't see it till college, I was like that movie messed me up. I thought, like, oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> Which part? And uh, the head, mostly the head in the box, really upset me. Oh, really? <laughs> not not yeah. the part when the guy's actually alive. The the oh, yeah, guy? I know. Yeah. <laughs> that was gross, but yeah, whatever. I, um, I, I saw seven, and I saw seven at the old Berlin Cinema, the uh, ninety nine cent cinema. Uh, the summer it came out, or the whenever it came out, and that scene where he like. <laughs> He wakes up. Everybody in the theater shit their pants at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think I think this film needed more of that to really like have like good word of mouth. Like, oh, I saw the X Files movie. There's this part where this Frankenstein guy got up and his arm fell off. Like bl- all that kind of stuff. All you get is the decapitated head, clearly in a pail that any horror maze I- in the country would have done, where some guy's blinking, but he looks like he's decapitated. Like that's is that the scariest part? Or a dog in a bodysuit lying on the ground barking? It just yeah. wasn't creepy enough. Is this the time? Is this the time that Saw came out? Was this when the first Saw came out? I can't no, this, remember. This, 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 is, this is years, years later. Yeah, it's like five years this later. Is, I think the first. This one is during the the franchise. Yeah, the franchise. Oh is yeah. Going so on. like that, the kind of like the torture porn stuff is out, like Hostel and all that yeah. stuff. So yeah, yeah. So maybe maybe some maybe some people went, you know didn't like it because of that. It's 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 like a little piece of that, but they maybe it's almost not horror enough to to attract the horror crowd. Um, you know what I mean? Maybe that's maybe if they did go horror, they would have had a bigger audience come to it. Um, but that's I, not the X Files. So would they ever do that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I'm, I didn't want that surgeon to make a human centipede. So I'm happy. That wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to see that movie. Again. The, or the, the second to last yeah. was it the second to last episode of the uh, revival series. The uh, the all, all the blood and stuff, the vampire kind of thing. It was really gross. Uh, or was it the third one? to last? Yes, we were, we were I, talking, think, like, I think so. Like that was grosser than this movie. Well, Home was a grosser. Um, let's not talk about episodes. So we're, we're, we're talk, we're but just like you yet. could, X Files, X Files can go grosser. Yes, it it has in the past as much as people will let it. TV, yeah. yeah, like we said, it's a very cool idea and concept that is just so um, muted that it, it it renders it like inert almost. Like it, it is, it's a cool idea, this Frankenstein thing. But like, we're not going to show you a lot. You're going to leave a lot to the imagination. And we're going to show bits and pieces. Yeah, it just kind of kind of negates it in the end. 
Okay. All right. So I have a couple more just random notes, and probably uh, Butler's the only one that's going to care about these, so I apologize. Uh, yes. Butler, did you know that Rennie was the original choice for Crycheck? I did not so know the, that. The bad guy in this, the main bad guy with the bad teeth, because he has bad teeth, uh, was the original choice to play Alex Crycheck. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, also, did you see that Samantha Mulder was in this? I thought I saw her, and I wasn't sure. The actress that plays the young Samantha Mulder. Uh, uh, Vanessa Morley. She's in. The, she has a camera. She's in the FBI agent. That when Walter walks in, she turns to look at him and he looks at her. So she's yep. actually the actress that played his sister when the, when they were younger. So I thought that was pretty cool too. Uh, but that is those are nerd notes. So I apologize. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious. Uh, you know, I know I, I always ask Butler this, so uh, I'll let, I'll leave him at the end. Uh, and and Joe or John, you can guys, you can guys can give me the answer if you want or what you think. Why do you think we're saying this film is forgotten, or even if it is, do you even believe it's forgotten? You don't have to agree if it's forgotten or not. What do you? Why do you think that we're saying it? I mean, I would say because yeah, it just got buried at the time. I mean, it got buried over Dark Knight. Like I said, I can't remember if I knew it came out. I mean, mm-hmm. I certainly knew the first one. I would. The name X Files sticks out. I know there's revival series. And I don't know if I I couldn't remember it now. So for me, it's forgotten. But it, mm-hmm. it obviously tanked initially. Um, I think it still made its money back totally if you go by budget, right? For overseas. It, yeah, usually what you have to do is you have to take the thirty million budget and double it uh, to oh, add marketing. So it probably it, it we talk. It's probably in the in the black a little bit, but not much. Not enough to get a third one. Yeah, I mean, Step Brothers. I mean, that was obviously yeah. swallowed up right away too. So I think I think it is forgotten that way. Mm-hmm. John, what do you think? I put it on the list uh, for two reasons. A, I know you guys are X Files fans, and I figured you would. I knew you would snap this one up. You gave um, us bait. <laughs> I gave you bait, but uh, but well, I mean, and number two, it, it truly is forgotten. I mean, if you if you went into a room of probably casual film fans and just said, hey, "Do you guys remember there was a second X Files movie?" I bet you most of them would not, um, mm. because a you know it, it died out in the box office. B it does not have a like if it was a werewolf movie, people might go, was that the werewolf one? People aren't going. Was this the two homosexual guys where one of them is dying? And you know, it, it, they, they, people are not thinking of of. I think there's not a heavy enough uh, plot element in this one for people to remember, and it's it's the reason I picked it is. Uh, Knowing you guys, I'm surprised this wasn't on your long list being X Files fans because it, it, I kind of said Star Trek Insurrection before. If I had to pick a forgotten Star Trek movie, I would say that would be the one people would forget about all the time. It's just kind of like a average episode that they've stretched out to a certain length. Um, and it did not produce a third movie. And by the time we did get the revival series, this was almost 10 years in the past. So I, I just think I, I think for something of a franchise like this, it's unusual to have a property that that, in my opinion, goes forgotten. Well, Butler, why didn't we put this on the list? Because we would just be fanboying out the entire time. It this would be a true. bad episode. It would be yeah, a so. Bad, so bad episode. <laughs> just to give you guys and people who are listening to this uh, an idea of, uh, of my fandom, I've seen. I, I watched the first season. Obviously, I watched the whole series. Um, when I met my wife, who was, would be my girlfriend, when I first met her, uh, the first thing we talked about was X-Files. So that's kind of like what we connected on. I rewatched the series and the movie before the and the two movies before the one that came out in 2018, the two seasons that came out there. So I've seen all, all these episodes uh, multiple times. Um, so uh, I, it's, I'm, I'm pretty big on it. But, I, I, you know, not everything works in the show. Not everything works in these movies. Uh, so I, um, you know, I don't, I, I don't blindly just, you know, hold the torch for X Files. Not, you know, it, there it is flawed. It's absolutely flawed, and this movie's flawed uh, for v- the reasons we all talked about. Um, but I will say this, Butler, you keep talking about werewolves. There was an episode in season one called Alpha. I looked it up. I didn't. I don't know this off the top of my head. It was an <laughs> episode called Alpha uh, in season six, not season one, season six that dealt with something that's similar to a werewolf i remember they did a werewolf-esque uh, so. episode but it wasn't, wasn't good, like but like, like john it's like john said it was like dog soldiers yeah. like did the, the werewolves were awesome in the photos the leaked photos and they mm. would have been some cool bad guys from older and scully sure all right mike where can they find us 
You can find us at ForgottenCinemaPodcast.com or uh, ForgottenEntertainment.com as we are part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Check out all the other great podcasts on there, including John's podcast, uh, On the QT is on there, the limited podcast about Quentin Tarantino. Uh, you can also find us wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Google, Apple, Apple, all that good stuff. Uh, Apple, Apple. Yeah. Apple, Apple. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, thanks for joining us today. I'm, I'm glad that we could find at least face to face, even though it's over video. But uh, I'm glad we could we could meet up and talk films. Uh, ho- hopefully, you'll join us for the other three at some point uh, if you can pop in. Uh, uh, but if this is the last time we talk to each other like this, good day, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to talk to you guys, and I'll still listen to your show. Uh, yeah, I guess you call this uh, longtime listener, first time caller. So, oh, no, that's that's, <laughs> nice. that's awesome. It's but but mainly you're my fan, not Butler's. Yes. You don't like that's, Butler's that's take. Pr- that's pretty much true. Didn't didn't uh, okay. Butler choose uh, Mortal Kombat Annihilation? So, oh, uh, suck it, Butler. <laughs> I didn't choose. We didn't do Annihilation. Annihilation was the Mortal Kombat. original Mortal that's, Kombat. That's close oh, I don't. That was to get Russell Lyman on the show because we needed video game movies. Yeah, because yeah, we're we're yeah we were whoring the podcast out for other people. That's views, right. So, yeah. so, anyways, <laughs> join us. Join us next time when we take over for uh, the pint. Where we're going to be talking about the 1992 film Toys, starring Robin Williams, Joe Cusack, L. Cool J, and a whole bunch of people. Uh, I got to tell you, I don't even remember. Mo- I remember some of it, uh, but not all of it. So I don't. I don't know how this is going to go, John. So uh, hopefully, uh, uh, I don't know. We'll say I've never um, seen it, and I, and I know it's pretty forgotten. So that's why I, that's why I picked it. <laughs> All right, everyone, thanks for listening. I'm Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler, and this has been Forgotten Cinema's takeover of the pint. And remember, the truth is out there.